Welcome to Rockstar Doctor Life. I'm Alyssa Longo, and each episode, my guests and I will bring you fresh, fun ways to rock your life as a health professional and create a business that aligns with who you are and the life you want to live. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Rockstar Doctor Life. Well, I wish I had hit record about half an hour ago because I've already been having an amazing chat with Dr. Michael Viscarelli and I know he's going to share with you some great ideas today on this episode. So I want to welcome you to the show, Dr. Michael. Thank you so much for having me. I'm blessed and honored. Appreciate it. Um, we, uh, I, I got to apologize. Let me apologize. We got we to gotta address it. I know my lighting's not great. I, I not, not that it would help me look better, but I got doors open, windows open. I'm trying to make this space work. I was showing you that I'm on four buckets to hold my computer in the air in a construction site. We're making it work. We're making it work. Well, I think what that already highlights is, you know, adaptability and making things work right when you need to. The view out of that window that you all can't see, or if you're listening to the show right now is absolutely gorgeous. I know that you're building a beautiful home for your family. So let's talk real quick. I mean, who is Dr. Michael? Um, give me a, a, nut, a capsule version of what are you doing right now? And then we'll dive into some of the great things we talked about in our pre-chat. Sure. Well, I'm, uh, I'm originally from Northern Maine. My mom and my dad still uh, reside up there. My father was a plumber. My mom was a hygienist. I had two older sisters. So I was the only boy and I was the baby. So I was super spoiled, <laughs> very much accommodated in my family pretty much given everything to what my parents could, uh, could provide and could give. Um, grew up playing hockey and uh, baseball as a kid. And obviously that led me to an interest in, um, you know, just, you know, human performance. Uh, I, I, I met a chiropractor along the way, Dr. Clint Steele, um, in my high school years, uh, towards the end of high school, that really changed the trajectory for me. I'm starting to think outside the box of what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to be an orthopedist because I had some shoulder surgery done. I had some uh, muscle repair done on my, on my, on my groin actually um, from a hockey injury. I uh, thought that was the route that I wanted to go uh, until chiropractic was introduced to me and that helped me get all the way down to Atlanta, Georgia and Life University um, where I graduated chiropractic school in 2012. So almost 10 years ago. And then my, my wife, I met while I was down there, I was waiting tables and I waited on her. And um, of course she immediately hit on me as being like her waiter. And uh, that was not um, at all, <laughs> that was not at all her style. She, uh, she was actually uh, there with a girlfriend and they saw a ring that I had on that said, Jesus saves. Um, and uh, they asked me where I went to church. And so we ended up going to the same church as a large church. And, and uh, so we started meeting up and attending church together, big groups of friends and going to lunch afterwards on Sundays. And, uh, I just knew I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her and she was from Georgia. Uh, and so we came into agreement after traveling and looking at different areas and we settled on Golden, Colorado where we wanted to open our practice. And that's where it has us today. Awesome. And in addition to your practice, you are working with lots of other docs, uh, coaching them in mm -hmm. AMP. How did that start? Yes. And, uh, and yeah, like let's talk a little bit about the values around that. Yeah, so AMP was an interesting development. Uh, I was... Uh, I remember I was in chiropractic school. I was listening to somebody speak um, at one of our classes. And I thought to myself, I was like, man, I really believe I have a heart to teach other people, you know, someday if I could make a success of myself as to how to do it. And I, but I didn't want them to be like me. You know what I mean? I, I don't at all strive. It was interesting. Somebody told me we were ordering a really unique wood stove fireplace for this, this property that we're, we're restoring here. And she's like, I could send you to another place like down the road that somebody installed it. And I was like, oh, somebody else has it around here. I don't want it. Like, I don't like being like everybody else. I like doing my own thing. There's things that I see about people, about their life. And I'm like, man, that's cool. You know what I mean? Especially from a mentorship, you know, mentor to mentee relationship. Um, but I, I was like, man, it'd be really neat to have people reach wild success doing it the way they want to do it you know what I mean, wrapped around the principle of chiropractic. So when I was in practice, we were only like 11 months in, I'm getting calls from, from guys like Patrick Gentempo, Chris Zeno, just some huge names in chiropractic that as a student, just so that, you know, 15 months earlier, I was like, wow, these guys are like icons, you know, and they're reaching out to me to ask me, how am I doing? And what am I, what am I doing? How am I doing it? Um, and so Patrick Gentempo invited me to a mastermind that he had. And then 
Chris Zeno wanted me on calls and I'm like, wow, this is wild, you know? And why all the while I'm, uh, you know, 11 months into practice and I'm staying up to like two, three in the morning speaking to students and young docs and they're asking me and I'm going blue in the face telling them and robbing my family of time and really much needed sleep as we were grinding in practice as to how we were doing it. And honestly, when we left school, I had a pretty good voice on school. I was pretty outspoken. I love people. We were serving on campus. I, I formulate mi like missions, like, uh, like drives. We collect warm clothes for De uh, Atlanta Rescue. Um, we would collect food and go get donations while I was in school. And I'd get students, I'd be like, you're going to go to this grocery store and you're going to get canned soup and you're going to go to this grocery store and you, you know, you're going to get beans. And we, you know, I was like, we're going to go ask for turkey fryers. We're going to go cook you know, chili on a, on a cold day down near like a homeless ministry. You know what I mean? And it was like that. And before I knew it, I'd have a hundred students like with me and we would do stuff like that. So I knew that God had like a calling on my heart to rally troops, you know, to serve humanity. Mm -hmm. And so I went to Jeremy Hess, who was my biggest mentor. And I was with Rob Schiffman at the time. And I went to Rob Schiffman and we said to Dr. Rob and Vicky, we're like, this is the idea. This is what we want to roll out and how we want improve your program to serve the masses at a greater level they had like 40 people in reach the world which was rob shiffman's deal and we were like you know serving in there and paying clients and i said this is what we want to do to impact on a bigger level and they really didn't want to do it they kind of were happy the way they were going you know kind of just like a conference here a conference there and a 15 minute coaching call I was like, well, that's not what I envision. I envision like modules. I envision like massive conferences. I envision like um, a community raising one another. That's what I recognize. And that what I didn't want to see one, one guy that made his living in the Mercedes 80s or one guy that it was his way or the highway on 15 minute coaching calls. It was like, we knew it took a village. So we we're going to create that village. And so we went and got our closest friends and most successful chiropractors we knew. And they were all just out of school and in a practice. And we're like, we're going to do this. Do you want to come with us? You know, and would you like to be a part of it? And uh, Jeremy Hess was my biggest mentor and my best friend. And he was, you know, 15 years in a practice. And we got together and we started AMP. And AMP stands for Advanced Mentorship Program for Entrepreneurial Development. And it's one of the first of its kind masterminds at the time, seven years ago in chiropractic. And it exploded hundreds and hundreds of members, a thousand to 1500 attendees in, in the conference spaces. And uh, it, I think it works because my why is to contribute to a greater cause than myself. And with that why, and you recognize that, Melissa, you don't look anything like me. You know, you, you have your own energy, you have your own folks, you have your own dreams and desires but wrapped around certain systems and procedures that we know are reproducible, that once you have them in place, you could morph them to really make them suit you, your flow, your boutique style of practice, which I love, mm -hmm. that represents you, that you feel authentic, you feel powerful. In. If you came and operated in my space, you may be on like that, um, you know, you're on like, you're on the visitor's field. You know what I mean? You may not feel like you know where everything's at. You don't, this isn't your flow. And it may, you may not be able to perform at the level that you normally can. Mm -hmm. We think that these practices should be a full expression of who you are. I don't care what you wear when you're in there. I don't care, you know what I mean? What sneakers, I saw somebody post the other day on a page, it was so funny. It's like, what kind of sneakers do you wear in your practice if you're a manual adjuster? And I'm like, or what kind of shoes? And people are like, Echo, Nikes. They like naming all the stuff that they wear. Somebody put me in a pair of Echoes, I'd kill myself. I adjust in cowboy boots. You know what I mean? I could care less. I'm not gonna wear Echoes or some orthopedic shoe. I wanna be me. You know what I mean? I feel good about that. Even though sometimes I think I'm like maybe a little over the top for certain people, but you attract who you attract. So Amp and, Boom, and dude. We'll Amp Boom. Boom. on right now, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, animal print booties. I don't know how it's taken us so long to connect because everything that you're saying is absolutely the manifesto, the motto, everything I've been teaching with the Rockstar Doctor Life and, and our whole vision of the show is like, you have the gift inside you to share your principles of health and healing. The world needs what you have to offer and it doesn't have to look like what anyone else is doing. And I learned that the hard way. It doesn't sound like you did, but you know, I learned it trying to be someone that I wasn't in practice for so many years. And when I got clarity around the kind of practice that Dr. Melissa wanted, 
and how that was going to free up time for me to help other people in other ways and be the kind of mom I wanted to be and be in relationships. Like my life changed. And now the energy that I'm bringing to the profession, to my clients, my people is, is totally different than I would have ever expected. And I love what you're saying about, you know, your practice should be the fullest expression of who you are. It shouldn't look like anyone else's practice. Well, if you think about it, and you're right on, if you think about it, um, we want to remove interferences from people in our practices to help them be a fuller expression of themselves. Well, so many of those interferences, you know, exist within us as we're coming out of school and going into practice. Some of us feel insecure if we choose the associate path or the independent contractor path, because the ideal path in some people's minds are opening your own private facility, right? That may not be your ideal path. And if you're living somebody else's path, that comparison, that expectancy is going to totally rob you of your own personal joy. Now, you're not going to be operating in your fullest expression. You're not going to be at your full volume. You're not going to be at your top energy. You're not going to be practicing at that fever pitch where things are just popping for you, you know? And I think about it, and I look back, and one of our biggest goals was we recognize that everyone's got their max potential inside them but we don't want people just to have great potential. We want them to be great producers. The more we can produce in our communities is gonna be a phenomenal reflection back in our profession. And our objective, our commitment, our line in the sand in our camp is to leave chiropractic in a better place than where we found it. And if we all had that commitment, Melissa, if we were truly committed and we really walked our talk and we said, we're not going to just die in our four walls. We're going to be movers and shakers in our community. We're going to be givers back to our community. We're going to be givers back to our associations that represent chiropractic well. We're going to be uh, givers back to the associations at the national level that protect our principles and our rights and back to our institutions that are advancing the principles of chiropractic man, we're going to leave a much bigger impact, a much bigger, better legacy. And we're going to give chiropractic the opportunity to flourish in the generations to come. Too many chiropractors, in my opinion, especially when we start getting into mentorships or programs or coaches, all that sort of stuff. So many people are just focused on their piece of the pie. And if you could potentially take a bite out of my slice of pie, oh, God forbid, I'm going to burn you at the stake. Well, there's none of that with us. We do draw the line in the sand against things that we think are bringing a bad rap on chiropractor or bastardizing chiropractic. Because remember, our, one of our first commitments is to leave it in a better place. Now that's based upon our principles and our values and how we see chiropractic. So we've drawn, you know, we've, we've gone toe to toe on some of those things and fought for the principles and the values for chiropractic and making sure that they're preserved. I just had a, my little daughter who's gonna be three this weekend um, tugging on the doorknob of this house. And I'm thinking to myself, I know nothing about this house. We're about to gut it and restore this whole thing amazingly. But I'm like, does that door have a lock? Because she's tugging on it. She's going to blow in here in a second. But I want my daughter to have something that she's proud of, that her daddy served and served well. And she could decide as to whether she wants to just be utilizing the services of our profession or whether she wants to be serving our profession. Mm -hmm. And it's on to us to make sure that it's in great shape, that it's in great shape for the generations to come. Yeah. And it's, um, it's powerful what you said about, I mean, clearly you're a leader, right? Leadership, I feel has been in you. It's, it's a part of who you are. You feel so, you know, you strong faith. You feel like you've been called to do this, to help other docs. Um, we were talking in our pre-chat about leading, you know, people in a sports environment and coaching, and you actually had some really great strategies about leading people in our offices, whether you have associates or team members. And I wonder if we could just dive into that for a tiny minute in here. Um, what have been some of the biggest tips of, that have helped you succeed in leading people in your team? Oh, trial and error. <laughs> I mean, just like, you know, just like crap in the bed, girl. I mean, you know, it's like thinking you're doing it right. And then the results are telling you you're not. You know, it's like people shouldn't follow me because I'm the loudest voice. I think people should follow me because I'm amplifying their voice. You know what I mean? That I'm helping them achieve their platform. And that's the same for you. You know, it reminds me of this. My wife grew up riding. Uh, I, 
I grew up in my later years riding to hunt. So we, we hunt on horseback up here in God's country. And we have horses down here on the property. We rode for about seven miles yesterday, my wife and I, because the kids were in school. This is like a new thing for us. My daughter's in preschool. My son's in kindergarten. And we're like, what do we do with all this time? The first day we went and got like queso and chips and drank half a margarita and almost passed out in the booth. I mean, that was like our first day where our kids are in school. I was like, we need to be more productive. So we came and we rode yesterday and we have phenomenal horses, but I've been bucked off these horses. Uh, my wife's been thrown. I, we have, there's been times where we did everything we could to catch them. You know, they're just running around the pasture. I've had times where it's like um, they've stopped and wouldn't go any further. And I want to blame the horse. I want to be like this freaking horse. I'm just going to shoot you and leave you where you lie. You know what I mean? That's like what I want to say. That horse fucked me off. And I'm trying to think of what did the horse do wrong? Did it step on a rock? Did it see an animal like a snake? Did it get spooked? What was wrong with the horse? My buddies that are like cowboys get on these horses and that horse does whatever they tell it to do. They lead that horse by specific commands and the horse just complies. Every time they get off my horse, they're like, dude, I would buy this horse from you. This is an amazing horse. I wish I had this horse. That's the stuff I hear from them. I'm like, that son of a gun just bucked me off and acted a fool, almost killed me. And it's his fault. It's not. It's my confidence. It's my clear commands. It's my leadership in that saddle, my confidence in doing so. And that horse just complies. So yesterday we rode all over the place. I'm like, this, I've had a lot of good rides with the horse. So I'm just kicking this horse. It's doing whatever I want. It never gave me a problem. It never spooked, never bucked, never stopped. And I know it's all about me. There's so many levels to leadership. There's so many levels. And I've learned that there's levels in leadership as chiropractors. It starts at first leading ourselves with self-discipline, you know, keeping that fire alive and at a fever pitch making sure that we're taking care of ourselves and we're focused on our self-development. So if you can't lead yourself, I can't help you. You know what I mean? If you can't lead yourself, you're never going to be able to lead other people. It's like an uninspired leader. Listen, you know, can't inspire their followers. So you can't fake that. No. And I've had moments where I'm, I'm pulling from an empty tank and I know I'm being, I'm faking it, you know? And so you need to lead yourself, but there's levels. Then you're going to be, you're going to go into practice and you're going to have to lead your team. Now I told you that I could leave a, a locker room full of degenerate hockey players to win a championship, keeping them sober, keeping them on curfew, keeping them um, on academic, uh, you know, good standing, taking their focus off women and on, on the game all that sort of stuff to win championships. I get into a, a, a office with like four or five women and I was lost. I don't care what men think. Leading a room full of women is infinitely harder and more challenging and different than anything most of us guys have ever experienced. So you're gonna lead your team. You could be leading associate docs. Of course, you're gonna be leading in the adjusting rooms with your community. You're gonna be leading in the marketplace with other businesses and standing out. And then you're going to be leading at home. For me, I have to be a leader for my family, for my wife, for my, and, and, and it's not because she's subservient to me. She is not, but there's certain things she expects me to show up in. She expects me to be a man in certain categories and to deliver and do it with consistency and not bucking her. And the same with my children. Now I got to lead my children, you know? And so there's levels to this. And one thing that I have found and I was sharing with you um, on our, our pre-call chat, which I often enjoy more than the actual podcast. <laughs> I just like getting to know people like you, which is which has been awesome. Is that one of the new challenges that I'm I'm recognizing and I'm adapting to? Is that it's like we're we're in arenas or we're in rooms where we're leading leaders. We're having to lead elite operators. We're having to lead the cream of the crop on a regular basis. That's a whole nother level of leadership. So. When you're leading professionally, like that's the next step for some people, once you come out of your community and your practice, you may decide to lead back inside your chiropractic profession. Well, it's the difference of just, you know, being your uh, high school captain, you know, your high school team captain versus being a, a, the captain for the all state team or the all new England team or the all American team, right? Now you're having to lead people that are on the same level of you as you. And, 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 but maybe they saw something that you had some characteristics and say, you know what, we're going to put you in this position of leadership. You've owned it. 
you've earned it, but you have people that are maybe better players than you. Oftentimes, sometimes I found that some of the best leaders on our teams weren't the best players. They were great players. They were consistent. They showed up and they did everything right. And in, in our profession, we have these scenarios where it's like, I don't have the best office, the biggest office, the highest collecting office in Ampton anymore. I don't. Neither does Jeremy Hess, my co-founder and partner. Neither does, does Dr. Eric Brower, Eric Kowalki, some of these elite operators. No, but what we can do is we can take people there and we can reproduce that. We can take people there and we can reproduce that. And we do that very, very well. And so there's levels of leading leaders. And we we're talking about associates. My first associate, Melissa, was a beautiful girl, very, very sharp. I had a really crappy team at the time, just like catty girls. I had the wrong team. When it comes to hiring, if I could encourage people not to hire out of necessity and urgency and to take your time, to be it's better to find the right cultural fit for your practice that suits the energy and fulfills the mission, that next key component to go to the next level versus just getting a heartbeat in a seat. That's where people make errors. They hire out of desperation and they get the wrong person on their team and they wonder why the chemistry's changed. They wonder why they've stagnated. They wonder why they're not advancing towards goals. And we've been there. Well, I had the wrong team and I brought in a great associate. They chewed her up and spit her out. Just catty girls, girls that were older than her, but less accomplished and were insecure and, 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 and took her down. And the thing that was the two most sad things for me when losing that, that girl was one, I felt like the, the situation failed her. Hmm. I felt like it could be a setback to her, her, um, you know, her career, her early career. The second thing was, was the reason I wanted an associate was for a little bit of freedom to be with my children and to go to jujitsu with my son, to get to pick him up and drop him off at school periodically. And when she, had to depart from our practice, I lost that freedom. And that broke my heart for her and for me. When we regrouped, I took my time. I didn't hire another associate just so I could get freedom again. I wanted somebody that would come alongside me and that would be a, a team leader that would take over authority with me, not tasks. When you delegate tasks, you create an employee. When you delegate authority, you create leaders. And so with my associates, we've worked really hard. I don't even refer to them inside the office as associates. I'm referring to them as associates because that's how we commonly understand that position right now on this podcast. But within the office, they're docs, they're adio docs. That's our office name. And I work solely on not delegating tasks to them, but delegating authority and raising them up as leaders, sewing into them as team leaders so they understand that they need the same respect from our team as the team gives to me. They need that same respect. And the only way you get that respect is you earn it through proper leadership. Mm -hmm. And so it's really been a winning recipe for us in the practice. Mm -hmm. I love that you said that, you know, trial and error, you learn through experience. That's pretty much how life goes. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you also indicated that with that first associate that you had, you know, it was a situation that was not in her favor, unfortunately. It wasn't her or the fit of the office. It was a situation. Now, look, Last year, we're recording this is January 2020. Like 2020 was an external situation that affected a lot of people, right? And many people have come through and been like, look, there were so many wins last year. I shifted this, I pivoted, I adapted. Um, you had a very interesting 2020. You know, your practice had to be closed for a period of time. I think there was a fire. I think the like, you were robbed. Like, can we just talk for a second about how do you rebuild and find resilience? Because a lot of people would be a victim to their external situations all the time. And that's probably only one example. I mean, we have things that happen to us in a daily life that can be traumatizing for some people. So can we talk about how did you find, how do you find resilience and grit and, and motivation to keep going when, when crappy things happen to you? Well, my grit was established at a much earlier uh, phase of my life. I can tell you that. And that's one of the biggest lacking components I see in this generation of business owners and, uh, and um, chiropractors is grit. I mean, that's one of the biggest lacking components to a very important recipe for success. Mm -hmm. uh, people fold early, you know what I mean? And fast. And one, that's not the Viscarellis. That's not our culture in my family. That wasn't the culture that my mom and dad instilled in us as children or that I witnessed in their actions. My dad never missed a day of work. 
My dad never complained about going to the mill. He worked at a paper mill. He was a plumber. He worked hard for 40 years. My wife's parents, my in-laws were small business owners, very successful ones. And they had to make things work. They relied upon themselves for their income. So she has that phenomenal pedi pedigree behind her. Um, we had a hell of a year. You know, you said it. I got robbed. I took Tara horseback riding in a national park and I, I, uh, I trailed the horses. I left my wallet in the car because I was like, if this horse bucks me off, I don't want to lose my wallet out here in the woods. So I left it under the seat in the car. I came back and I saw glass on the ground and we were robbed broke in. They took me from like $5,000 cash. People would be like, why did you have $5,000 cash on you? Uh, I had 5,000 because I was going to pay for an old truck that I had worked on the next morning. I pulled the money out of the safe and I pay for stuff with cash. So the hell with you. If you think that that's a problem, that I had $5,000 in cash, um, you know, it lesson learned, but uh, I still pay for things in cash. So you probably robbed me right now too. Um, the only difference was my daughter's trying to get in. The only difference was I just wish I wrote up on that guy. It's like, why couldn't, I was just talking about this at our conference. Why couldn't I come out of the Valley while they were in the act? And I could have just, you know, I'm on the horse. And I mean, I could have just, I could have shot him, but I mean, it would have just been so satisfying in some weird way. I would have wounded him. I wouldn't have killed him. But so we got robbed. They got two designer bags for my wife out of the car and her wallet and everything. So it's, it's terrible. And then somebody stole our mailbox and our identity and went into the bank and withdrew money. And my, my ranch burned and we we're closed for five weeks. And then my cabin, the whole Grand Lake, Colorado burned in the East Troublesome Fire. It was just boom, boom, boom. But if you're wise to it, and this isn't the first hit you've taken, you understand that you're being tested. You understand that you're, you're growing. Jeremy has said something recently, and I want to paraphrase it, but essentially said that change is inevitable, growth is optional. Yep. Change is inevitable, growth is optional. I look at every, every situation as more education. I remember we threw down like 100K right out of practice, right into practice, making money through 100K at Orange Theory Fitness, right? Stor short story, Melissa, it, it sucks. Or Siri didn't suck, but our operating partner sucked. And I had this very successful businessman in my practice who I used to call my five minute mentor. He'd come in in between adjustments and just sew into me and I'd learn stuff. And he's doing my $100,000. He goes on this investment that you're about to lose. He goes, just a little more education. You just paid for a little more education. And I looked at him, I was like, I just came out of a quarter million dollar education. I didn't want any more. I didn't want to lose 100K. And I was, my grit, awarded me through hard work to get the money, that money back out and not lose. And I got the education that way as well. Every experience is more education. And I've got to tell you this. I know that I serve a faithful God. I serve a faithful God. So I understand before the hits come that my blessings are going to be way more plentiful than my burdens. That doesn't mean we're not going to go through trials. That doesn't mean that we're not going to go through challenges. And I understand when you're in the storm, it's difficult to see the sunshine at the other side. It's, it's difficult to see the, the clearing of the sky and the beautiful sunset and everything that's coming your way. But I know it's coming my way. No storm lasts forever. And it's all within your mindset as to, as to how you're going to receive that education. You could kick and scream through it or you could open arms, receive it. And I've only seen God promote my family. I've only seen God promote our lives, our finances and everything through these experiences. But here's the key. So many people are tired. So many people are fatigued at this point of going through this endless trial, these tribulations that we've been facing through 2020 and 2021. You could look at it and you could say, man, I hired all this staff. We were all in prep mode coming out of 2019. We're forging. And then everything stopped and I had all this high payroll and income slowed down. We, I've heard those stories countless times. You know, we, we were having record months and then it just stopped. You know what I mean? And it's like, okay, you can keep dwelling on that. Or you can see how you can pivot, regroup, and forge forward and turn your burdens into blessings. So many people are so tired and so fatigued that they're, they're making decisions with a real weakened state of mind. Mm -hmm. And if I could only encourage people to say, listen, take inventory of the situation, but don't make any life-changing decisions right now while you're mentally fatigued strategize, vision cast, ask for dreams, ask for visions and you'll receive them. And so I, I mean, I'm grateful for these struggles because I can I tell you right now, I've leveled up as a leader through this process in a big way.
in a big way. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, you're forward through fire, you know, sometimes you got to come through it to get to that next level. And it's hard, but we're shedding skins and husks and, and uh, it's only going to allow us to go further faster in the future. Yeah. And you're a different person in the process and a part of our constant evolution. And uh, yeah, thank you for sharing that. I love it. You know, you're definitely someone who is confident who they are. You know, we talked about, you know, you're wearing cowboy boots. I'm wearing my NLP print booties. You know, you're happy being who you are. You don't want to be different. You want to be different, right? And we talked about how important that is for practice, being who you are. But what do you think holds people back, right? In, in being who they are and really owning themselves and not trying to be like someone else. This sounds like something that you know, easy for you, right? You own, you own who you are. Um, but yet so many people struggle with that. They're trying to be like someone else. And like, I'm with you hundred percent. I think the fastest way to an unhealthy life is trying to be someone that you're not. And, you know, when I say this to clients, you know, it's like a light bulb goes off, but then they can still struggle in implementing, whether it's a change in procedure, whether it's a change in technique, whether it's changing their relationship or how they dress or whatever it might be, they struggle in being who they are. And what would be your advice for, for people listening or watching and, and embracing who they are a little bit more? There can be so many deep rooted, you know, factors incorporating why people resist that. Just be self-esteem and self-confidence. We fear of being accepted or loved. And I do have this weird thing in me that I do appreciate people's approval, but there's a fine line be between living for people's approval um, and uh, losing who you are, you know what I mean? And I think the biggest thing is this fine with emulating or finding mentors that you're like, man, I really like this aspect of how he leads, how he is with his family, right? I really, you know, I had buddies that like want to move out to Colorado and go into the mountains and open their practices, but they're from Pittsburgh or they're from somewhere, you know, they're from somewhere and maybe, maybe that doesn't suit them. They want to be close to family. My wife and I have no family out here. We came out here. We, we have our kids 24 seven. If they're not in school, we go on date nights with the kids because we don't have anyone. We definitely don't trust anyone to watch them. So it's like one of those things where you have to be okay with that. You have to, you have to understand what is your vision for your life? Who do you want to be? And you can, that can evolve over time. That can develop, be a work in progress. But honestly, emulating some, some things as people do, that's fine as you make this collaboration of what brings you joy. For me, you know, for, for Tara and I, we love riding horses. We love the culture, the Western cowboy culture. I'm no cowboy. We're more horsemen, but we love the culture. It decompresses us. So when my friends all want to go to the beach, that doesn't, me getting my pasty white body in a swim trunks down in, 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 in Cabo, I'm like, that doesn't decompress me. I'm more stressed leading up to it because I'm like, shoot, I haven't had my shirt off in months. You know what I mean? I'm like, I got to go down there and, and burn. You know what I mean? I'm like, I'm going to, it's going to suck for everybody involved. So it's like, that doesn't decompress me. Going to Jackson Hole for the 4th of July and wearing boots and a t-shirt and, and, and jeans, that decompresses me. So finding out what brings you joy, what brings you peace, what brings you happiness are the things that you have to identify. And then you build a life that allows you to pursue that with reckless abandonment and accomplish it and give yourself grace in the accomplishment. It may not happen overnight. So I wouldn't seek everybody's approval. Um, and and I, would, I, would, I would really introspect and define what brings you joy, what brings you happiness, what brings you peace. And through all of this stuff, as I've watched my buddies, like I've seen a buddy go through a midlife crisis. I've seen people like not sure what they want to do at the end of 2020 because they're, they're super tired. I've seen people make real crazy changes. I think that there's an intangible for people in terms of being a good leader, a good business person, a good spouse is consistency and stability. If you're, you know what I mean? If you're, if you waver and you fluctuate with the wind, man, you're going to see that expressed in all areas of life, especially business and relationships. And, um, I still have some best friends that I've had for decades in my life. And, uh, I cherish those relationships, but it, it, you gotta be a steady person to be able to maintain stuff like that. And it's the same thing in business. You know, I, I, I think that one thing that uh, I've enjoyed a lot in, in business is that it's not mundane. You know what I mean? It's not cookie cutter. There's something new every day. And there's so, there's like you said, day-to-day -day mini challenges. And then there's the big ones that are like, there's like a big asterisk on the calendar of what happened. 
Um, but that keeps me stimulated. But if you're operating out of an inauthentic self, you're not going to find peace or joy in anything you do. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter how good looking your spouse is. It doesn't matter what you drive or, you know, what you live in. It, it, it doesn't matter. You'll still be reaching for something more and you'll feel unfulfilled. And so my prayer for people um, is that they can find that and they can get good counsel. And they can speak to people to help them develop those sort of things to live an authentic self because it'd be far more of a fulfilling journey in life. Mm -hmm. And their life not only would feel more fulfilling, their practice would probably grow too because they'll be, they'll be vibrating in a different energy, right? And um, that's Absolutely. one of the e easiest way to grow your practice is to attract the right people based on your heart and vision and, uh, and showing up as fully as yourself. Because our message, the way I speak to people about you know health and wellness or clients that I'm coaching is different. There's going to be some common elements, I'm sure, to what you say or what you know one of my clients says. But at the end of the day, our message is supposed to connect with different people. And we need to be unique. And I, I love that you embrace that message. And you guys do in your programs as much as, as I do. Um, I want to respect your time and give you some time to get to that little girl who's uh, waiting for her dad <laughs> outside the door. Watch a pistol. Well, do you have Do you have uh, any daughters? I don't have daughters. I have two boys. Oh, I thought we were gonna have two boys. I, we, my wife, you know, she did the whole home birth and she was a champion. And uh, and uh, the second pregnancy, my son is is my firstborn, and he's six. And my daughter, we thought she was a hundred percent a boy. And and she is, when she came out, I looked four times to see, I just was like, that guy was like, show me again. I just wasn't convinced. I'm like, I know I'm a doctor, but I, I you know, where is it? I was just, we just thought it was going to be another boy. I am so grateful I had a daughter. This girl is hotter than a pistol and she's about to be three. She tells everyone she's a five-year-old boy. We're like, are you daddy's little girl? I'm a boy. Are you going to be three? I'm five. And I'm like, it's everything that her brother is. And she just wants, I mean, She's as tough as nails and she keeps us on our toes and God knows exactly what you need in life. You know what I mean? And, uh, I, you know, I got to tell you, I, I, you know, picking your team, right. I've got a phenomenal wife, a super strong woman, and she deserved to ride in the heart of a daughter. I mean, she does. She did, you know, you're going to make your boys tough, but they're going to know, uh, intimacy. They're going to know affection because of your touch. And, uh, you know, Tara, I, I just was wishing boys into my life. Um, just feeling like guns and horses and ATVs, dirt bikes, I'm like I was built for it, but she's all those things and more. And uh, I'm just so grateful for how God is just always, always knowing what you need and what you want, um, maybe different than what you need. Um, and so I'm grateful for that. And it's been fun. And she, yeah, she's been tugging on the door earlier. She stepped in a, um, a rat trap, like a sticky rat trap. And so it stuck to the bottom of the boot. And then I finally got it off and then I sat in it. And so we've had our throws today. We've come to blows a couple of times. <laughs> You've had a full down. day and, and I'm thrilled that you've made time for this conversation. I know it's been of tremendous value for me and, and also for the people who are going to watch this or listen to the episode of the show. So I want to thank you for your time and for what you're doing and leading your family, leading other people and the message and the heart that you have for a profession that I also love quite dearly. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you. Right back at you, Doc. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed today's show. Find out more about today's guests and everything else that we talked about in the show notes. You can also find all this content and so much more, including videos, blog posts, and how you can work with me on the Rockstar Doctor Life website. If you haven't yet reviewed the show, we'd love it if you headed on over to iTunes, subscribe, and leave us a review about what your thoughts are about future episodes for the show and what you like best. Feel free to connect with me on Instagram at Melissa Longo DC and of course on Facebook. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time.